Hey guys, this is John, and I'm playing E-Gear Out in a 15 plus 2 game on LeeChess.org. We're back in the saddle again. It's been a while, hasn't it, since I played a standard game. Someone on Twitter informed me that, I think it was like four weeks since I recorded the last standard video. So we're off to the races. Hope everyone is doing well. My summer commitments are drawing to a close. We're now into September. So hopefully I'll be posting a little bit more in the coming weeks. Let's be in Keto our bishop and just get ready to castle. Black is choosing an unusual e6 and g6 setup. So my question would be, if Black intended to fee and Keto the bishop, why would they play e6? I can play a pawn move in the center if I like. d4 comes to mind. Really, any of these three pawn moves, c4, d4, or e4, makes sense. But I'm also of a mind just to castle and kind of see what Black is up to. Hmm. Maybe I will play d4, because if I castle, that does give black a chance to play c5 and try to get into some sort of English-y setup. Yeah, I'm going to play d4 to try to cross that plan. Black could still play c5 if they want. In which case, taking is interesting. But so is playing d5 or maybe just c3 to support the pawn. Hmm, okay, so now d5. Yeah, I'm just very curious how Black is going to treat this entire setup. Looks like a, a Catalan with a Black Bishop on g7 instead of its usual post on e7. So c4 is possible. Let's castle first. Just get that king to safety. Hope everyone's doing well out there. I feel like these are the videos where I kind of uh, have more time to talk about stuff and really connect with you guys. And also for you to follow the pace of the game too. I know there's quite a few viewers out there who don't like the Blitz and the Bullet videos as much as the Standard. So shout out to the, the diehard Standard people who really look forward to these videos. Thanks for watching. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and play C4. I think this is the proper way to try to challenge Black's setup. I mean, you're not going to outright refute what Black is doing. It's not like Black has made any huge mistake or anything. It just looks a little suspicious what they're up to. So now castles. The thing is, I don't want to take on d5 quite yet, if at all. I want to maintain the tension. If I could get black to take me, and then I win the pawn back on c4, then I have a 2-1 to one advantage with pawns in the center. So knight c3 could be played. Black could think about taking, but I bet knight e5, among other moves, will probably recover the pawn. I'm also thinking about queen c2, standard operation just to defend, defend the pawn on c4, and maybe eventually support e4. Knight bd2, I could choose a plan like knight bd2, b3, bishop b2, doesn't look that inspiring though. Let's go knight c3. Keep it simple. So what have I been up to? In August, I played that tournament, which I'm currently going through on my channel, the Twin Ports Open. And then shortly after that, I was in Charlotte, North Carolina for a week, teaching a chess camp, which was a lot of fun. And then I was back, and I was kind of just consumed with work stuff for a couple weeks, teaching mainly, and also working quite a bit on Chessable. I've been doing that lately. We shot some promotional material for Chessable, so that's very exciting. You get to see me in uh, a very professional light very soon, I hope. <laughs> Bishop d7. Okay, so this move looks really awkward. It blocks the queen from defending d5. I'm thinking of taking on d5 and then playing queen b3. That's off on the reaction to this move. That would hit b7 and also d5. And if black had to play bishop c6 there, I could jump into e5 and I must be somewhat better. So that's my first instinct. I'm liking that. Other moves are bishop g5, maybe bishop f4, maybe knight e5. I could jump in with the knight right away, but the concrete nature of this, and then queen b3, appeals to me. Just asking black how they're going to avoid losing a pawn. Do they want to play that really ugly-looking move bishop to c6, which they, I think they kind of have to. 
So let's do this. If black takes with the knight, I can play e4 if I want to try to take over the center. I could also take on d5 and then play queen b3, kind of along the same lines. By the way, I also turned 30 years old yesterday. That's right. It was my dirty 30. <laughs> and coming to grips with my own mortality has been kind of rough too. Just kidding. It's fine. Everything's good. 30 is exactly like 29, or at least that's what I'm going to tell myself. I feel okay about it overall. <laughs> All right. So they did take with the pawn. I think queen b3. Any reason to play knight e5 first? Probably not. Yeah, show me what you got. I was trying to think of ways he might sacrifice a pawn here, but I don't really see a good way. Sometimes black can play a developing move in a situation like this, like knight c6, and dare you to take the pawn on b7 in particular, but I just don't trust that because d5 is hanging. So knight c6, I'll probably swipe on d5 instead. I'd rather have this pawn than the B pawn if I had a choice between the two. I think they'll play bishop to c6. That would be my expectation. Maybe bishop c8, as weird as that looks. That actually may not be a half bad move. Then black could resolve to put a pawn on c6, which I think is what they'd really like to do against my bishop on g2. Hmm. No, black plays knight c6 instead. Okie doke. So is the plan here, if knight takes d5, to go bishop e6. So knight takes d5, bishop e6, pinning my knight. Knight takes f6, and then take back with either the bishop or the queen. Whereupon I can take on b7. I might be up a pawn, but maybe my development will be a little hampered. Is that the argument that black will make? Let me check the other capture too. So queen takes b7, rook b8, queen a6, knight b4. Hmm, chasing my queen. My queen has some squares it can go to, like a5. Black could get into c2, rook b1. That doesn't look winning for black or anything. So maybe I can get away with taking on b7 as well. So he's challenging me to, to win a pawn, and he's saying that he's going to get a lot of activity in return. That's often a good strategy, especially if you find yourself on your back foot, and you think you're bound to lose material anyways, or you don't want to defend all your weaknesses. Try to offload a little bit of material for activity. So I am thinking of changing course and taking this pawn now, because I'm not sure about this line. Maybe I should have investigated this line more deeply earlier. Knight takes d5, bishop e6, knight takes f6. Black does get a lot of play. Let's say queen takes. Queen takes b7. Knight takes d4. Knight takes d4. Queen takes d4. I am taking on c7, however, aren't I? Taking on c7 is helpful on that line. Let's rehash that. So knight takes d5, bishop e6. Knight takes f6. Comes with check, very important. Otherwise, I'd be losing my queen. So if they play bishop takes f6, I can again take on b7. Knight takes d4. Maybe black can throw in bishop d5 somewhere, I'm not sure, but let's assume knight takes d4. Knight takes... Yeah, the suffering might be worth the pawn. By suffering, I mean the activity black will get in the short term. I'm going to give this one a shot. I mean, it's the more principled move. I'm down on time, as per usual. But let's really challenge black's setup. I think queen takes b7 could be played, but black 2 will get activity there, and this way I'm at least putting black's idea to the test. And they take this way instead. I'm really having a hard time predicting my opponent's moves. <laughs> they look outwardly bad, but you never know. Guess we'll find out after the game. Black is also playing very fast and making some committal decisions. But hey, they have a 2300 rating, so they must be doing something right. Okay, bishop e6, so offering to trade queens. Well, I just assumed I was going to trade and then play e3 against that and defend d4. 
nice and solidly. Yeah, we got to take. I could also throw in bishop g5 after they take back with one of the rooks, but black may play f6 there, and I do have to worry about d4. So I think on the whole, e3 is probably the smarter way of going about this. Again, I'm looking for ways black can get activity with moves like knight b4, but I somehow trust in my setup. So if bishop g5, just checking this move one more time, f6. I guess I could play something like bishop f4 hitting the c7 pawn. Knight takes d4, knight takes d4, rook takes d4. Also b7 would be hanging there. Don't like abandoning the second rank though, potentially. I'd like to keep that second rank on lockdown if I could. Okay, I'm going to play e3. I think if knight b4, I'll have good counter arguments like maybe knight g5 or just bishop d2, asking black if they really want to be bold and take on a2. I'm envisioning something like knight b4, bishop d2, knight takes a2, knight g5, and that knight would be kind of stuck, at least in the short term. So rook e8, black is unconcerned about being down the pawn. They're just bringing more pieces into the game. Well, probably bishop d2 now. Just looking for tactics that can mess me up, but now let's complete our development. We've got a nice pawn structure in the center. D4 is well defended, and it's blunting this bishop. Black's pieces are decent, but they're not going to get through my center pawns so easily. Now I just plan to play something like rook fc1, and maybe offer a trade of the light square bishops now that they planted this guy on d5. I think rook fc1 is a nice way to start here. Again, just searching for tactical ways black can make my life miserable, but I don't see any. Yeah, get this guy into action. So next I'm thinking about doing this. If I could play this maneuver, so knight e1 to d3 to c5, and hit that pawn on b7, I think I'm starting to poke and prod and weaken black's position further. Often when you win a pawn, you go into consolidation mode. You try to make sure you shut down all your opponent's counterplay. And I feel like I've already done that with my last few moves. e3, bishop d2, rook fc1. And now I can look forward to actively trying to outplay my opponent. Yeah, so knight e1 is the move I was liking here. And if there's a trade, I think take with the king. So I can keep that knight bound for the d3 square. Might have to watch for knight takes d4 tactics coming up, but that won't be an issue yet. Another move that comes to mind here is b4, trying to go b5, but I think trading off the light square bishops first is a, a better plan. This does undefend the bishop, though, on d2, so I mentioned d-file issues. If I play knight d3, I'm going to have two undefended pieces lined up on this file. I have to look at tactics involving black sacrificing temporarily on d4 to try to win some material back. So that will be foremost in my mind. I'm trying to play a little bit quicker now. Uh, this is actually a strategy I've been experimenting with, even in my over-the-board games. Like when I was in Duluth playing the Twin Ports Open, I tried this as well. And that strategy is trying to play faster when you're not yet in serious time pressure. So before serious time pressure hits, like making an effort to play faster to avoid that really, really, really bad time pressure. Okay, so knight d3, bishop takes, king takes, knight takes d4 is the idea I'm a little concerned about, so maybe I should play rook c2 first. I don't think a6 threatens anything at all. So rook c2, on the other hand, or even rook c5 is another move I looked at here. But I'm not sure I want to take away that square from my knight. Yeah, let's just play this. Nice and easy. So that way this bishop is defended. So next, if I play knight d3 and we get a trade... I don't think I have to worry about a knight takes d4 operation because my bishop on d2 will be defended. So after like knight takes d4, e takes d4, rook takes d4, I can move this knight away somewhere and black will not have rook takes d2. I'll illustrate that after the game, no worries, if you didn't follow that. But hopefully that reasoning makes sense. So just defending a loose piece.
Oh, going back to what I mentioned about being 30 years old. I heard a while back that the optimal age for a chess player is their early 30s, something like 31 or 32. Because this is the point in your life where your mental faculties have not yet diminished to any great degree, but you've also built up quite a, a bit of experience, presumably, um, in life and chess, especially. You've probably been playing for quite a while at this age. So that's the assumption I'm going to operate under, <laughs> and I'm going to be actively trying to improve my game, you know. I don't play these games exclusively just for your guys' benefit. Like, this also helps me a lot, too. Keeps me sharp, makes me a better teacher. I do have some aspirations still to make Grandmaster. It is a goal I'd like to accomplish someday. I know I'm not taking so many steps to play GM norm tournaments and get my rating above 2,500 feet A, but I think I could get there at some point. And if you're watching this and you're a little bit older, just know that it's not too late for you to get good at chess. That's one of the great things about this game is you have plenty of time to do it. I mean, heck, like Vishianen was the world champion uh, before Magnus several years ago, and he was in his early 40s, right? So that's a testament to how good at chess you can be, even at a traditionally more advanced age. Wow, bishop takes d4. Okay, this move I didn't see coming. Did not see that at all. <laughs> so I see the point of it. Will it work? I don't know. I mean... My earliest thought is that it does not work because e takes d4, knight takes d4, rook takes c7. Where's the beef? Bishop takes g2, king takes g2, and then some sort of discovery to try to attack my bishop as well. I'm just not buying it. I could also play rook takes c6 if I want to get two minor pieces for the rook, but I just i got to look at this line first and foremost. So e takes d4. They could insert bishop takes g2 as well. But let's say king takes g2, knight takes d4, rook takes c7. I think that's the key position. Because right there, I'm up a piece. So unless they get it back, they're going to be suffering. There's various knight moves like knight b5 and knight e6 that could be played to attack my rook and also the bishop on d2. But I think in either case, I retreat here. Ah, but maybe... Huh. Maybe they can play, like if the knight's on b5, they can play the rook into e2, and then I go here. No, I don't see that working. Rook into e2, rook to d1, knight to d4, rook back to c1. Knight moves away somewhere, and I can move my bishop, like I could even take on h6 then. I know that's a whole ton of arrows. Sorry about that. Okay, getting low on time, so I'm going to go out on a limb and say I can do this. And knight takes d4 right away, okay. So let's take this guy. Oh, 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 oh. I missed that. Yeah, definitely missed that detail. He's going to play after rook takes e7, he's going to go knight e2 right away. Aha, uh -huh. I missed that he could play that. Take knight e2, king f1, bishop takes g2, king takes g2, rook takes d2. Uh, I can take on b7 there. I'm still up a pawn, but that's not what I wanted. Don't think I really have a choice at this point, though. Well, that's not entirely true. I could still play bishop takes here if I wanted to. But I am going to be allowing him some counterplay if I do that. Bishop e3, maybe? Bishop e3, knight takes c2, knight takes c2. Kind of a long haul from there, though. Hmm, this is a tough decision with limited time. I must say. Yeah, I'm going to take here. I'm not sure about that other line. I was seeing stuff like rook takes e1 as well. Again, I'll have to check after the game, but... Yeah, I miscalculated. I missed this knight e2 move. This is a nice resource by him. And now I have to do this. And probably take with the king. 
Do I want to tick with the knight? Nah, let's tick with the king. So I, I'll be clinging to a one-pawn advantage, but my coordination looks highly suspect here, doesn't it? I have to make sure that this rook doesn't get down to e2 and he attacks f2. So sloppy technique by me, allowing bishop takes d4 and not seeing all the consequences of that move. We'll see what happens, I suppose. Yeah, knight d4, I was thinking knight f3, but probably black has a draw at least after that move. Yeah, I think knight f3, rook into e... Or sorry, not rook into e2. Take, king takes, rook e2 should be pretty drawish. Rook f1, rook takes b2, etc. I'm actually slightly on the worst side of that position. Nothing crazy bad, but still annoying. Hmm. Anything else I can do here? Nothing I really see. Yeah, rook c1 doesn't help. He is ready to bring that other rook in. I was thinking about rook d7, rook e2, king g1. But that doesn't work as a knight f3 check. King g1 idea would be rook takes f2, rook takes d4, which is kind of a funny idea, but now nah, I think I got to play this as much as I dislike having to do this. Because as I described, I might be on the worst side of a theoretical draw after he plays rook e2 next. Because I think I pretty much have to defend that pawn. So rook f1, and then he can take on b2. It's a little annoying. Okay, let's bring this over. I'll have to take... After he plays that. And now, here's the question. Do I try to guard the A-pawn, or do I just offload it? Uh, he offered a draw right away. That's pretty nice of him, actually. But um, he could try to make me suffer from here. I'm definitely going to take this draw, because... There's absolutely no way I could win this position, and a draw is the best result I'm going to get. So yeah, he could he could make me suffer from here. No, oh, he said I won't win on time. <laughs> well, I don't think he would win on time. I would never flag in this position unless I did something really bad, but I might lose from here. Like, it's possible. But the thing I was going to mention, and we'll look at in the anal analysis... This poses me an interesting practical problem. Like, do I play rook a1 and go passive to try to defend this pawn? Or do I play some move like rook c1, and then after rook takes a2, check and bring the rook to a8 and try to draw in that manner? Put my rook on a7. That's a theoretical endgame. There's been a ton of stuff written on that endgame. Like, I would refer you to Duretsky's endgame manual, for instance, if you're interested in checking that out. Three pawns on one wing versus one pawn on the other. So we'll, we'll explore that, because rook a1, I don't know. I probably should not play that. I probably should go for the rook c1, rook c8, rook a8 idea. So allowing bishop takes d4 was sloppy on my part. I actually thought I was being safe with rook c2, but I just didn't really give this idea much credence. Yeah, the thing I miss is this knight e2 move right away. I was kind of assuming that black was just going to take on g2, and then after king takes, I was looking at knight b5 or knight e6 attacking the rook and also hitting the bishop on d2, whereupon I could drop my rook back, and I think everything's fine. But this move order caught me unaware. So actually, should I just take on d5 here? Hmm, taking on d5 might just refute black's idea. If I play bishop takes d5, rook takes d5, then take... Knight takes, rook takes c7. That's virtually the same position. Oh no, again they have knight e2. I keep missing that move. 
Yeah, 92. I need my king to end up here. So the 92 check. This move might actually work out for black. So the other thing I could do at this critical juncture is I could play rook takes c6. This is another move I mentioned. Trying to take the dark square bishop after black presumably takes my rook. And getting two minor pieces against the rook. But that's messy. I mean, I would have preferred not to allow this in the first place, is the main thing. That's just so ironic, isn't it? So the move that I played to try to be safe actually backfired on me. <laughs> and allowed black to, with this operation, win a tempo by attacking the rook on c2. And then he's got the knight e2 idea. Hmm. So how best to play this position? I mean, I could always overprotect. I could always play bishop c3 if I wanted to be super duper safe. Bishop c3, that... That makes d4 rock solid, and then I can get the knight up to d3. Maybe that's what I should do. Probably other ways of playing it, but... So, nice tactical awareness by black. I mean, their opening was not good. The opening and the, the position they got heading into the middle game was, I think, just downright bad. Unless there's some long-term evaluation of this position that I'm not appreciating, but I mean, after e3, black didn't even do anything aggressive. They just played rook e8 and bishop on d5. I mentioned that black has good pieces, but hey, an extra pawn is an extra pawn, and yeah, I mean, for sure I should be able to consolidate somehow, but I didn't do that. Downright bizarre play in the opening, to be honest. <laughs> like, I've never seen this uh, sort of setup before, and bishop d7 is just like, that almost looks like a beginner's move, if I'm being quite frank. Blocking the queen. All right, let's check it out, though. So going to the analysis board. Sorry, this got kind of cut off on the side. If I toggle that... I guess you guys can mostly see it, but it just got cut off on the edges right here for the evaluation. So the... Final count is 5 inaccuracies, 0 mistakes, 0 blunders for me for a 16 average centipawn loss. 2 inaccuracies, 0 mistakes, 0 blunders for a 13 average centipawn loss for him. So let's go back to the beginning. So I played knight f3 and g3. I promise I won't play this all the time. I will mix it up, guys. <laughs> but I am pretty comfortable with this system of late. As I mentioned, I think just the combination of e6, g6 doesn't make a lot of sense to me because... Against knight f3, black has so much flexibility, they can fianchetto their bishop right away if they want. So it's unusual that they resorted to this fianchetto after playing e6, because usually e6 is a precursor to black playing d5. That's almost always the case, or f5 if they're a Dutch player and they're trying to go for some stonewall Dutch system. But instead this happens. So I was just trying to play natural moves in the opening. So here I occupied the center. I mentioned that I wanted to try to get the, the jump on black if they do decide to play c5. So if I were to castle, for instance, they could try to do this. And I know that this setup, knight c6, knight e7, is acceptable in, for instance, an English position. So I was wondering if they were going to angle for that. But instead, d4, d5, I castle, knight f6, c4. So now we have like a Catalan position where, as I mentioned, black has played g6, bishop, g7 instead of putting the bishop on e7. Had black captured on c4, it's important to note that I have several ways I can get the pawn back. If I really wanted to, I could check right here, fork the king in the pawn, regain it like that, but also moves like knight a3, as the computer is saying, or knight e5, going after the pawn this way, are possible. So when you're playing c4, it's oftentimes never a true gambit. It's more so a temporary pawn sacrifice if black decides to take with the goal of trying to knock out one of their center pawns so we can eventually get two center pawns against their one. So knight c3. Yeah, and this is really weird. Bishop d7. The computer also does not like it. I didn't mean to disparage my opponent uh, when I said this looks like a beginner move, but that's just the objective assessment of this, this move. Like, strong players don't play moves like that because, um, I mean concretely it invites what happened in the game and it's just really ugly from a coordination perspective too 
So I would expect a move like knight bd7, uh, maybe taking on c4, maybe b6, bishop b7, develop the knight here. That would be a more coherent way of playing the position for black. So this is baffling. So I took on d5, which the computer actually does not like. So it says playing bishop g5 is better. Looking to put pressure on d5 that way. Here I am threatening c takes d5, e takes d5, knight takes d5. With the pin on the knight. But c takes d5 seemed like such a principled way, principled way of punishing bishop d7 that I couldn't resist going for it. So I'm curious what the computer thinks will be wrong with this. So here and then queen b3. Always good to look at queen b3 when your, your opponent develops the light square bishop early in this type of setup. Yeah, now knight c6. So it looks like black made a good decision here. I was wondering about bishop c8, because black could play bishop c8 or bishop c6. Bishop c6 doesn't look so inviting due to knight e5, for one thing. And I can put pressure here. But bishop c8, on the other hand, as bad as this looks, like black has wasted two moves playing bishop d7 and then back to c8. As bad as that looks, it's not so easy to exploit because black is ready to play c6 on the next move. And I know I have a nice jump in development. Like after this move, bishop g5, I have all my pieces out. But let's just say black plays c6 here. Unless I can open the position immediately in some way, black is probably going to be fine. They'll gradually complete their development. So that's why the computer is recommending e4 here if we were to go into this position. 9 BPM. I'm only 1300, but played a game today with only one mistake and four inaccuracies. I basically learned from John's YouTube vids. It's good to hear. Very nice to hear. So Bishop C8 would have been intriguing. I would have been curious to see how the game would go after that, because I probably would have been looking to seize the initiative in some way, like Bishop G5 followed by E4. But it would have been instructive. Knight c6 was also um, pretty dynamic. I guess bishop c8 is not dynamic, so I shouldn't contrast the two. But knight c6 is the most dynamic move possible, I think. Just letting these pawns hang, challenging me to take one, but trying to get activity in return. So I played knight takes d5 after initially being scared of that. So first I was looking at queen takes b7, but I thought black was going to get several tempi. Maybe I can get away with this, though. Like knight b4, you always got to make sure your queen is... Not getting trapped, like I can't go to any of these squares, for instance, but I can probably take on a7 and live to tell the tale. But I played knight takes d5 instead, so taking that center pawn, and I thought he was going to play this bishop e6 move. Attacking my pin knight, and then after knight takes, taking with either the queen or the bishop. Let's say bishop, that's probably smarter to keep the queen defending the pawn on c7. And then I can go take this pawn, so right now I'm up two pawns, but black can win one back with knight takes d4. And after this, so I'm not sure which way he should take here. Yeah, probably with the queen, because bishop takes would allow bishop takes a8. So queen takes. Not 100% sure what's going on here. Because I am up a pawn. I could even take this pawn on c7. But black has such great activity that he may have some reason for optimism. I think in this type of position, you would not want to take on a8, because... Even though you gain one more point of material, the rooks are a long ways from being able to participate. The two bishops and the centralized queen can cause a lot of damage in the short term before white gets coordinated here. You can see that the evaluation is roughly level. So I thought that's what black would do. Bishop e6 and then try to aim for this. Challenge me to take on b7 and we'd have a slugfest from here. Black being down a pawn, but again, I got to quell his activity shut down all of his threatening pieces. Try to use my extra pawn. But instead, black took on d5 and then proposed a queen trade. Hmm. Bishop f5 is another move according to the computer. So bishop e6, queen takes. Rook a takes. e3. And I was feeling really good because if black doesn't have something immediate right here, what does he have to show for the pawn? That's really my big question. 
So I was looking at black can play knight b4 maybe and go after that pawn on a2. And I wouldn't want to play a3 due to knight c2 hitting the rook here and now bishop a2 would trap this rook. <laughs> Although ironically here I'm also doing well apparently because this knight is trapped. Maybe I stand a decent chance of winning it like rook c1. Probably I do. So knight b4 did cross my mind though. I thought like at the very least if bishop d2 knight takes a2 this knight may not ever escape since I have the b4 square covered and probably I have attractive stuff like knight g5 attacking the bishop opening up the attack on b7 I'm still solid in the center but black just played the calm rook fe8 computer likes it so just bringing another piece into the action I complete my development bishop d2 black does put the bishop on d5 so opposing my bishop on g2 and now rook fc1. So why did I use the f rook? If you figured out why during the game, good job. But if I use the a rook, then bishop takes a2 is possible. You can go snipe that pawn. Also, long term, I feel like there's a chance I might be pushing on the queen side. So playing like b4, a4, b5. And in that case, the rook on a1 may be useful on that wing. Whereas, you know, if you're deciding which rook to put on a file... You always have to envision the position and ask yourself what the other rook is doing. So the rook that you did not put on that file, what its chances are. Like, where are its prospective files in the coming moves? And I don't really see this rook being good on the F file, the E file, or the D file. I don't think it's going to be typically well-placed on those squares. Which is weird to say, because I do have pawns in the center, right? But my hope is that these pawns are self-sufficient. I think with E3 defending D4... And black not really having a good pawn lever to attack those two pawns in the center, that mini structure. I shouldn't really need my rook to defend those. So that's why I played rook fc1. There's a concrete reason. We want to stop bishop takes a2, keep the rook defended here. But also some long-term ones as well. Yeah, and now h6. This just looks like a waiting move for black. Maybe knight g5 is discouraged when he plays this move. Computer likes a5. Rook c8, maybe. Hmm, so here's where I start going knight e1. And I get into some trouble in a couple more moves. I mentioned that b4 was possible, but first it seemed logical to try to trade the light square bishops to me. So that's what I was looking to do. But b4 does threaten b5, so maybe I should go for this. And if a6, I can think about a4. Again, Minority attack, using less pawns to attack more on the queen side. So knight e1, for now it's safe, I think. a6. So if black does the sacrifice here, like bishop takes d4 in this instance, I don't think it's going to come with the same punch because there's no rook on c2 that they're gaining a tempo on with their knight. They are threatening knight e2 with a fork on the king and the rook, but I do have a moment to sidestep that. So you can see the computer likes rook d1 right here doing exactly that so knight e1 is probably fine a6 yeah and the overprotection move bishop c3 is the top move recommended by the computer right here just be super duper careful in regards to that d4 pawn overprotect it so that finally i can play my knight up to d3 and hopefully into the coveted c5 square it's instructive very instructive so I played the safe-looking move, but it backfired. Let me show you what would happen if I played knight d3 right away, because this is also something I was mentioning. If I do this, I have to be careful about black sacking on d4, and probably sacking with the knight is best to keep this strong dark square bishop. Because then after e takes d4, rook takes d4, two undefended pieces right in the line of fire. Not fun. And if I play rook c3, I suspect this bishop on g7 could be helpful, but probably first just double up. Yeah. And if this knight moves away, now that it's attacked twice, I'll lose the bishop on d2. So black's going to win their material back. Ironic, right? I look at the capture on d4 uh, in one permutation if I play knight d3 right away, but after rook c2, the seemingly safe move, it's also working for black, I think. 
Gotta love chess. <laughs> so yeah, bishop takes d4. Really nice shot. Best move of the game for black. Because I think on anything else, I'm just going to slowly put my plan into motion. So hopefully knight d3 up to here. Maybe if I play knight d3 next, I still have to be concerned about bishop takes d4. So I think it's safe to say I just completely underestimated this whole bishop takes d4 operation. So rook c2, bishop takes d4, e takes, knight takes. If I had a little more time, I was probably going to investigate different options right here, seeing as how the game continuation didn't work out. I played rook takes c7, just not appreciating that knight e2 thing. But I could also play, like, bishop takes h6. That's one move I mentioned right before I played rook takes c7. Idea being, again, to try to get two minor pieces against a rook, like hoping for a position like this, where I've got bishop and knight and rook against my opponent's two rooks. And I saw here that my bishop would do a good job of covering the d2 square. But the thing that scared me off is this move, rook takes e1. And I just didn't have enough time to, to con uh, contemplate and calculate what was going on here after rook takes e1, knight takes c2, because black is winning their piece back. It is even material for the moment. Maybe I'm a little bit better. Here, pin the bishop, d6, c6. Yeah. I'm clinging to a slim edge here. But the sharper position, the more likely you are to make a mistake, especially in time pressure. So I went for rook takes c7. Yeah, I'm a knight e2. So, as I was describing, if black were to play this first, well, then I'm completely happy. Bishop takes g2, king takes g2. I have this undefended bishop, but like knight e6 or knight b5, let's say knight b5, attacking this and this, I can always bring this back and solve both problems. Then I think really the only thing black can do is either knight d4 or maybe this. Ah, but my rook is defended. Yeah, I can just play this. My knight on e1 does a good job of holding this. So that's fine. So, yeah, if, if we were to get that position, then white wins. And something like here, here. I think rook almost to any safe square, like rook c4 should be fine. Yeah, rook c3 should also be good. Here, rook e3 counterattacking the rook on e8. So black never has time to take this bishop. Then we're up the piece. But cleverly done by black. Now knight e2. So hold off on that trade for one more move. Buying them time to go take on d2. Yeah. Maybe I should take with the knight in retrospect. What about knight takes here and then rookie one ideas pinning the knight? I didn't appreciate that during the game. Because then knight f4 could be planned. Couldn't it? Trying to capitalize on this pin piece. Still not sure about my coordination. Like, this whole arrangement looks awkward. But maybe. Rook takes b2, knight f4, knight takes g3. Hmm. So the computer thinks black, their best bet is to sacrifice the knight and then try to gobble some pawns, I bet. Yeah, b5, try to take this pawn on a2 soon. White's playing for the win here, though. Hmm, knight takes g2. So maybe I should have considered that, followed by rook e1. Yeah, definitely should have considered that. Probably wins the knight. Is there any way black can save it? I guess they could play like rook e6 maybe or king f8. What happens if one of those moves? So rook e6, idea being to, um, well, get the rook on a defended square. So knight f4 is, is not working anymore. Now I can take this pawn. Up one pawn. Still everything to play for though. Instead I took with a king and now rook takes d2. I took on b7. Yeah, and I'm even here maybe making some small mistakes. Knight f3 is better according to the computer. Just trying to get active. Probably with the same idea as before. Knight f3, rook takes b2, rook e1. And pin. Maybe? I guess the, the knight is safer now that the king also is not attacking it. Rook d1 instead is the computer's offering. Maybe trying to go here. Yeah, and I probably have enough counterplay, even though I'm now down a pawn. I took on b7 instead, though. Knight d4 was a good move by black. Getting ready for the rook to come into e2. Knight f3. Black must take. Rook in here. Rook f1, defending f2. 
And now, after these somewhat forced moves, Black mercifully offered a draw. So the time is not the big factor here, in my opinion. It's more so like how I'm going to, um, just in theory, draw this position. Do I play Rook A1 as the computer's indicating? Or do I sacrifice the pawn and play for activity? I feel like a pro might sacrifice the pawn and play for uh, the active rook on the seventh rank. So like rook c1, rook takes a2, and say, let's say rook c7 right here. There's so many circumstances where these end games, rook end games, up a single pawn, especially it being uh, a pawn that is blocked by black's own rook, or the side with the extra pawns own rook, it can just end up in a draw. So let's say black plays a5 and just starts marching this pawn. Probably I should play h4, which is a good structure to keep in mind, because white only has one weakness in the structure, the pawn on f2. So just to illustrate why this could lead to a draw, uh, let's just say white's waiting here, like king e3, rook a1, king f3. I'm not going to approach the pawn. You don't want to bring your king over and try to win the pawn, because if you do that, you're opening yourself up for, for instance, like king d2 here, here, black can play a discovery. Or is the discovery the right term? Basically, they can move their rook to try to threaten queening, make you take the pawn, and then go take one of the loose pawns. And in this case, it comes with check and a transition to a winning king and pawn endgame. So on the other hand, if white just keeps their king kind of safely by their pawns, and then as soon as a2 is played, uh, just wait again, this is a draw. Even though the computer is saying minus three in black's favor, don't be fooled. This is a draw because... This rook will never be able to free itself. White's rook is always attacking the pawn. And black can't create another pass pawn on the king side with this particular structure. Sometimes they can, but not with this structure. Uh, white has a symmetrical structure opposing black, three on three. F, G, and H, it's a draw. Even if black gets their king all the way up to the B2 square, or B3, and tries to support the pawn so the rook can move, at the moment they do that, white will deliver a check on the B file and just check the king around, basically. Black has no shelter. So I don't want to go into that endgame too much, but uh, actually Tony Rotella did a good series of videos. I think it was at least one video on rook endgames. I don't know if it was multiple videos, but and exactly this type of endgame was analyzed by Tony in great detail. So go check those out if you're, if you're interested. Rook endgames with um, a single pawn difference, one side being up a pawn. Because you got to know the theory in these. That determines a lot of your um, decisions, whether you go into this or not. My only fear about this is there are some annoying tries black can uh, attempt here by keeping the pawn on a3. Like in this type of position, if black keeps the pawn on a3, there is a way they can try to bring the king over while keeping some shelter for the king to go to a2 eventually. And that's where I mentioned Duretsky's endgame manual, where he goes into this in quite uh, great depth, really. So a savvy player would do that. They would keep this pawn back. They wouldn't push it here. And at some point, try to bring the king over to help. But in the process of doing that, black may lose one or sometimes even two pawns on the king side. Because with the pawn on a3, white's rook is not bound to the defense of the pawn. Whereas when that pawn reaches a2, white can't go dilly-dallying with this rook wherever they want. Like if ever the rook moves away from the the A file, like rook b7, black is just in winning instantly by moving their rook and promoting. Okay, so recapping this game. The opening, I think, was very suspect for black. Again, just kind of a strange move, strange setup. But then bishop d7 was really an awkward and, I think, just bad move. I don't really like how black handled that position roundabout here. Like, even in this position, position, I thought bishop e6 was a better try. But then again, I was not careful enough roundabout here when I was trying to exploit my extra pawn. I had relaxed a little bit. I didn't think too highly of possible sacrifices on d4. And to my opponent's credit, he found the exact right moment to play it, right after rook c2. Bishop takes d4. And the tactics seemed to be checking out. I think there might be some ways for white to maintain a small edge. But, yeah, it's, it's tougher now, and I didn't have much time to figure it out, too. So my time pressure was catching up with me. I wonder what bishop takes d5 as well. I don't think I looked at that move. Bishop takes d5, rook takes d5. 
now take here. I had, I did look at this line. This is kind of the same thing. I was saying if here there's again the check on e2. I could also move my bishop and try to play with two minor pieces against the rook. So some position, yeah, like this, let's say. Yeah, in this case, that's interesting. That's a, a detail worth pointing out. After bishop c3, in this case, black cannot play this because after take and then take on c2, I do have rook e8 check followed by a mate on h8. So lots of tactical complications. So thank you for the game, Igeraud. Uh, he's asking if I'm going to be streaming. Probably not tonight, getting a little bit late. And anyways, thank you guys for watching, and I'll be back again soon with more videos. Talk to you guys later. Bye.